this is just our understanding of community development in our lag. We think it's difficult to, I think you should try to define it, but the way that we work, we want to say it's difficult to split community development between different themes or different headings, such as economic development or renewable energy. Uh, we think if you do that, it can sometimes oversimplify your analysis of what's really needed in your area. As an example, if you take economic development and you want to pursue job creation, yes, you can report 10 jobs created or 20 jobs created, but in, particularly in rural areas, we think that 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 kind of measure does not sit in isolation to environmental or social concerns. So the job, you can say, yes, I've created a job, but it doesn't say anything about the individual who has that job. It doesn't say anything about how many jobs that person has or what difference that job makes to his or her community and the opportunities that that gives. Simply to say, I guess, that we find it difficult to put community development into particular headings. We think it embraces a lot more. I think that life choices as well in rural areas, and probably in urban areas, but I always, I've always lived in the countryside. In rural areas, I think life choices are quite complex and quite integrated. So if we are going to engage in community development in rural areas, you need to take a complex and integrated approach to your, to your program. Before I get too theoretical, I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of my community. Um, it's right up in the north of England on the border with Scotland. There's a few small towns which used to provide services to the agricultural sector, but increasingly they're looking towards tourism as, a, as opportunities to develop their economy. We have a lot more animals in our lag area than we have people. And uh, this, this breed of sheep is a Scottish blackface, so we also welcome our visitors from over the border. We tend to help each other a lot. And sometimes we need some help from our neighbors to get to work. This is a photograph that we took two weeks ago. Uh, and I think when I was looking at it, I thought, it reflects how much we rely on and how much we cooperate with other people on a day-to-day -day basis. Forget about leader and your local development strategy. It's how we live in rural areas. We rely on each other. We cooperate with each other. Uh, the last picture for now. This, we're quite independent in Northumberland. Some people in Northumberland, they don't want to be English and they don't want to be Scottish. So we're left in a bit of a, a, bit of a vacuum, you can say. Uh, but this gentleman in the front of the picture, he's called Richard, and he's running a, one of our really successful leader projects. He's a, he's a businessman, and he, he runs tours for visitors in his, in his free time. But he's now running a community shop, which we gave a leader grant for them to purchase. Um, and he spends more time with that project now than he does with his own business. And people rely on him now more than they ever did. Um, and the project has made much more, many more links than we actually anticipated. There's been a lot more unforeseen outcomes. Members of the community who have felt isolated now feel part of it because, just because they're volunteering in the shop. They've been able to deliver other services as well. Um, they took on the running of the post office and the local pub, which is very important. Basic service delivery. Um, just one point to bear in mind, I think we often find that successful projects really need a project champion. One individual who will really pursue the goals and inspire everybody else. Wave the flag and say, this is what we're going to do and I'm going to help you get it done. So Richard's our project champion here. All right, so uh, what have I said so far? Um, in rural areas, we think that there are complex livelihoods, and we think that leads you to make all sorts of different networks and links with other people. We think that formal and informal networks are really important. 
And maybe you can all think about the networks that you as individuals are involved in. What sort of networks do you have as people? And what sort of networks does your lag have as well? On a personal note, I have networks in craft groups where I go and learn my hobbies. I have networks through sports groups. But we also have professional and formal networks with our managing authority, with our local politicians and so on. Think about the networks you have in your area and how they might help you pursue your priorities. And we think that, you know, because we cooperate every day and we network with people every day in our normal lives, leader as a model actually reflects our reality. You know, you can talk about the seven or eight principles. I learned the eighth principle of uh, Petri yesterday. Um, but you can, you can describe and explain those principles, and it sounds as if you're explaining life in rural areas without calling it leader. Maybe that makes it such a good model for us to pursue rural development. Okay, I'm just going to run through a few um, areas just to really stimulate your thoughts and encourage you to come back with feedback afterwards as well. Um, encouraging participation. I'm only going to make one point. Um, we think that in Northumberland, we, we think that leader uh, is useful because it stresses the link between analysing and identifying the needs locally and coming up with those decisions and making, uh, sorry, coming up with the solutions and making those decisions locally as well. What we did, um, we identified evidence of need and also some opportunities as we were putting our local development strategy together. Um, we talked about low wage economy and low profit businesses who are access to services, but also some kind of independent spirit and a high level of new business startups as opportunities for us. We involved local authorities, local researchers, universities and schools, business people in that analysis and they're working with us now on finding those solutions. So the simple point I make is if you involve them at the beginning, you take a, a big stride to ensuring their ongoing participation as you, as you go through your process. Uh, the involvement of LAG members. When I was looking at the question, I, I thought, well, what, what are we trying to achieve with LEADER? Um, and yes, we are trying to achieve our targets and deliver outcomes and so on, but we are also trying to leave some capacity in that rural area. And we hope that that will be a legacy somehow. Um, Petri reminded us that leader is, is a strong model and I thought that was an interesting presentation yesterday. But I think it relies again on individual lag members. Um, one of the ways that you can leave a legacy is to think about how we raise the capacity of lag members themselves. And we provide some training opportunities and opportunities to travel and network with other lags. But you might have your own ideas of how you do that. Um, I don't know if, if you don't give out any money, any grants through LEADER, can you say that you've still left a legacy just by working with your lag members? It's an interesting question, I think, and you know, something that, that we think about a lot. And uh, essentially, the, you know, these are local people who are going to be there after the money's gone as well. Okay, uh, three examples that we're using in Northumberland to try and support the bottom-up approach. Firstly, we take a collaborative approach to designing projects. The idea is that one project design will encompass a lot of different activities which will then feed off each other instead of having separate contracts for all of those different activities. Um, it encourages people, project promoters, uh, applicants, researchers, to meet up and talk about their activities, maybe in an arena where they would not normally meet. And it allows new ideas to develop and, and more value to be added. We're hoping that it reduces bureaucracy as well. And I know that there are similar approaches in, in other countries. 
Uh, Sweden and Scotland both have good examples. Um, we're trying to mainstream research. We have a lot of, uh, can we say, constructive conversations with our managing authority about this idea of compliance. What do we need to provide to make sure that we are compliant and that the European Court of Auditors is not going to come and take our money back? But uh, we are also involved in development and we are trying to develop a local area. And we think that learning is really important part of that. So we try to, we say mainstream research, but we try to encourage every project to have an ongoing evaluation to continually strengthen what they are doing and strengthen future activities as well. And finally, uh, we've ring-fenced a little bit of money to encourage both leader applicants and also potential leader applicants um, to go in on study tours and maybe discuss what they are doing with people around Europe, either in England or, or further afield. Um, and we have had some good examples of people coming back with their ideas much more enhanced and coming forward with, with good uh, project proposals. Finally, some thoughts on communication. It's important to communicate locally as well. And maybe your project proposal, your project applicant, sorry, is uh, the, first, the first port of call when you come to communicate, because that is also part of learning. Focus on good publicity stories. Every lag that you're involved with will have a good news story, something that you can be happy to say, this is what we've done, this is what we've helped to, to deliver. Um, and that makes a big difference for people who are involved on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And also the lag members, they're all local people, they help with, with that communication. Uh, some project examples very quickly. This was a music festival that we supported. I think a few people spoke yesterday about having fun with Lido and you know that's you can do that with by engaging in the projects and, and going along and, and seeing how excited people get um, while still providing economic benefit to communities. I think I wrote on my notes that's important. This was a lady that we helped set up in business. She runs Pilates courses for horse riders. But she lives so far away that she put her business in the horse box and took her business to the, to the customer. So all of her Pilates equipment is in the, in the box behind her vehicle. Uh, this is Dorothy. She runs uh, some specialist um, physiotherapy, some specialist health care for people with physical and mental disabilities. And it links into the care farming or social farming agenda. And finally, we're running some micro-hydro projects with, with upland farms, and they are becoming businesses now that produce energy in an extensive farming system rather than an intensive farming system. But they produce energy instead of consuming it. 